this because I think how 9-11 has been used and abused you know this is something that politicians still refer to on a regular basis oh well everything changed on 9-11 we've got to crack down on security because of 9-11 got to do this that and the other because of 9-11 this is a mantra that we have drilled into our heads so this isn't some terrible terrorist atrocity that happened in a foreign country almost a decade ago this is something that directly affects all of us to this day all of us globally because think how it's been misused. You know, this is the pretext for this unending, nebulous war on terror, where there is no defined enemy. Anyone can be targeted as an enemy because of 9-11. The definition grows broader daily. Where we've seen two illegal wars waged on the basis of 9-11. The fact they were ready to go into Afghanistan weeks after the attack. Well, I'm making one of my very rare visits back to England. Uh, I actually left and moved to Germany last year to escape the encroaching fascism of the UK state. But I'm back here to support um, Dr Stephen Hopwood in his campaign as an independent parliamentary candidate in the forthcoming general election. So um, there's going to be a huge truth fest, a big conference of interesting speakers in Totnes tomorrow night, uh, all, or in fact all during the day tomorrow. Uh, many, many people um, talking about different areas of... Um, less well-publicised um, areas of political interest that actually need to be brought to the fore, and that's what um, Stephen's doing. So we're sort of hoping to get people thinking. I think when um, Dave first described the plot of MI6 to try and assassinate Colonel Gaddafi, it was really the straw that broke the camel's back um, as far as my service with MI5 went. Um, because we'd been there for between five and six years, both of us working in different sections, and we'd seen so many different things going wrong that you sort of put up with it initially in one section because you think, OK, well, this is just a historic throwback or this is bad management and the next section would be better. But the longer you stay, the more you see going wrong. So by that point, it was just a case of, well, we have to leave and we have to do something about it. Um, yes, that was in 2005 that we suddenly were approached by people in the 9-11 Truth Movement in the UK. Uh, it was around the time when my book came out, which is called Spies, Lies and Whistleblowers, uh, which describes uh, Dave's and my experiences, um, both of what we saw in MI5 and then also what happened to us when we blew the whistle. And they approached us at an NUJ conference um, where we were publicising the book. And basically said, well, you know, look, you've blown the whistle on an example, two examples of false flag terrorism where we have um, intelligence agencies involved in trying to carry out terrorist attacks and then blaming it on other groups. Have you not actually thought about 9-11? And we hadn't, of course, because when 9-11 happened, we'd been living in London and Dave had been enmeshed in his court case, his, his fight against the charges under the Official Secrets Act. And then after that, it had just been a fight for survival and going through the appeal courts. And so it was a bit of a nightmare. But at that point, we thought, hmm, OK, let's have a look. And we were visited a, a couple of weeks later and handed some books and some videos. And we sat down and read the book, The New Pearl Harbor, by Professor David Ray Griffin. And both of us went through it in a day. I mean, we just couldn't put it down. And it really was a case of the scales falling from our eyes at that point. I mean, I remember reading it and thinking, how can anyone say there isn't a need for a proper inquiry, a proper investigation into this? Um, none of the official account really stands up. There is so much evidence out there that contradicts what we've been led to believe. And since then, um, obviously, I've done more research into it. I became very involved in uh, building up the UK 9-11 Truth Movement. And then now I've moved to Europe, sort of working more internationally as well. And I think it's still key. I mean, people in the mainstream media have been dismissive. And they, now they say, well, it's old news. It happened almost a decade ago. Who cares? But when you think how 9-11 has been misused consistently by our political and governing classes, and they keep saying, well, you know, things change then. And it's been used to take us into this war on terror, the unending war on terror, which is 
you know, it's going to go on for a generation at least. It's been used to justify the illegal wars in the Middle East, and it's been used to turn our countries into you know, police states. So I think 9-11 is very much a sort of core part of anyone who wants to campaign around any of these issues or against any of these wars. Because if we can say, and we can very easily say, that the official account does not add up, then we can say, well, the justification for all these atrocities since um, is removed. So let's have a rethink. Let's pull out of the Middle East. Let's stop um, the slight or totalitarianism that we're seeing in our countries. And um, let's take our democratic power back. So from one chance meeting uh, when I was trying to publicise the book to, um, to now, five years later, I still think it's a very key issue for us all. And, you know, it does fit. Obviously, we know that false flag terrorism exists. That's what we had to blow the whistle on. That's why we ended up going on the run around Europe, living in exile, all the way through to two court cases. So we know that it happens. Um, and the, official, um, the officials and the intelligence agencies are, of course, desperate to cover all this stuff up. But once you know that, then you look at 9-11, it's just so obvious. There's so much evidence, and there's so many credible people now across the planet um, who are now questioning it. The issue of 7-7, I think, is trickier. Um, I wouldn't necessarily talk about that in any great detail, but I think once you accept that um, the premise of false flag terrorism, then you've got to look at every major terrorist atrocity and ask, well, is the official account the real account? Um, and I think 7-7, there are some issues which are slightly dodgy in the sense that Peter Power uh, was running this huge counter-terrorism drill um, and said on live news feeds that day that, in fact, the drill had been at exactly the same um, tube stations as the real attacks, so suddenly he, his exercise went live. So I think that's an interesting point to look at. Um, and also the apparently photoshopped CCTV picture of the four terrorist suspects when they were boarded the train at Luton. The timeline doesn't add up. So I think there are questions that need answering, um, but I don't think there's anywhere near as much evidence as there is with 9-11. But of course we've never had a proper official inquiry into it. All we've had was a, an anonymous report of the official narrative which came out from some civil service office a few years ago. So rightly, of course, people are questioning 7-7 and the families are demanding that we have a proper inquiry. Well, we do have a problem in this country, of course, that we have the uh, 2005 Inquiries Act, which now means that anyone setting an inquiry within the government can actually um, set out the terms of that inquiry and then can vet the findings. So, of course, we're never going to get a real inquiry. Um, but I think people just need to keep digging. Uh, you know, false flag is something that happens historically. It happens regularly. It's a perfectly standard thing for intelligence agencies to get involved in. I mean, not just in Britain and America, although America is probably the past master of false flag, false flag atrocities for its political advantage. But um, Israel's got involved in certain attacks. So even in Russia, there was a very notorious case of false flag terrorism where Alexander Litvinenko, the KGB whistleblower, who strangely fled to the UK for refuge, he um, blew the whistle on the fact that the modern incarnation of the KGB, which is the FSB, had bombed some apartment buildings in Moscow in 1999 and blamed it on Chechen rebels as a pretext for a full-scale invasion of Chechnya, which, of course, subsequently went ahead, which led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of innocent people and mass rape and mass atrocity. So, you know, every country does it. Every intelligence agency will use false flag terrorism in order to gain political advantage and to, to achieve their political goals. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, I'm a former intelligence officer for MI5 who has been aware and involved in blowing the whistle on false flag attacks. So what I'm saying is it's historic reality. The reason it's not um, talked about in history books, of course, it's the old cliche that the victors write history. So um, the victors tend to be the people in government. They can ensure that, that their version is the one that um, is, is put out there and that's what we're told to believe. Then, of course, you get the, the whole legal infrastructure protecting their position, so that with things like the Official Secrets Act, with the libel laws, with the anti-terrorism laws, people are not allowed to talk about this sort of information. So, and then, of course, we get the media, which will be banned from reporting it under some of this legislation, but also a media that will self-censor and be prey to government spin and will be controlled by, um, by the same sort of people within government. So there are all sorts of reasons why this information doesn't get out there. Uh, and I think mainly it's government control and government spin.
Uh, well, that's a very good question. I'm, I don't know the answer. I don't think anyone can categorically say one way or the other who is behind uh, false flag attacks, who's really pulling the strings. Um, but I think certainly looking within Britain, there is what is commonly called the establishment, which is a meshing of interests of the governing and ruling classes. So this is where you get the sort of cross-pollination between the intelligence agencies, um, government ministers and MPs, big business, the media people, uh, the arms industry. And these are people who tend to belong to a certain background and who know each other and they're all reliable chaps. And they will set the agenda undemocratically behind closed doors. So then we get into a position where they decide it's in their interests or, you know, the country's interests. Unilaterally, they decide something and go ahead and carry out an atrocity in order to, you know, build up a market for things like the arms industry, in order to build up a... Um, an environment politically where they can get away with, with taking away our basic rights. And this is all highly undemocratic. I wouldn't say it's any big sort of um, necessarily agenda, perhaps. I think it's very much a sort of vested class interest to a certain extent. But then, of course, we get into the supranational environment where we see the whole sort of structure mirrored. So, for example, going back 10 years, um, there were reports on the Internet about a, boot, a group called the Bilderberg Group, and it was always dismissed as, an, as a conspiracy theory. Now, of course, this is mentioned quite regularly in mainstream media, and it's been well documented that uh, leaders, again, within those fields of the media and government and intelligence and big business and the arms industry um, will meet annually at the Bilderberg Group to discuss what are the emerging themes around the world and what needs to be done. And these meetings are secret, so they're undemocratic. We have no say... Um, as a people, as citizens, and what, what is decided, what is discussed, and what their agenda is going to be. And they go ahead and, um, and carry out whatever they need to carry out, you know, create wars, carry out false flag attacks, um, put their backing behind certain politicians to get certain governments in certain countries. And that's not conspiracy theory. This is documented, as I said. It's in the mainstream media now, even. So groups like that, I think, um, undermine and erode completely the very notion that even in the West we live in true democracies because they can take these decisions behind closed doors. I mean, it's not just the Bilderberg Group. There's a sort of business conglomerate, the Carlyle Group, the Trilateral Commission, Chatham House. Um, so it's, it's well known that these groups do these things and it's well known now who's involved, you know, all the leading politicians and things. So it's undemocratic and that's why I think an issue like 9-11 can wake people up to what's going on, but it's only a starting point. Then they can start sort of following the trails and looking at all these issues and hopefully get active, not just sit and, and feel depressed about it, but get active and get positive and get out there and take back their democratic power. I think that's the key. I think that there's certainly a school of thought that is leading towards a sort of globalised trade and banking um, uh, amalgamation. And it's something that I've just read recently, which is the Naomi Klein Shock Doctrine, which I found a fascinating book, where you have this sort of school of thought emerging out of the Chicago University, the Chicago School, um, coming out of a, an academic called Milton Friedman, who is basically trying to move the economies of whole countries right, as asset-stripping countries. And they've been doing it systematically, starting with Chile in the early 1970s. And these sort of disciples of the Chicago School keep cropping up every time there is some sort of crisis in a country. It's economic problems or economic meltdown or whatever. And they go in and they use things like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to bail out problem countries. In fact, they're doing it with Greece as we, as we speak. Um, and then impose conditions that asset strip those countries, that allow in foreign competition, that lead to increasing globalisation and just impoverish the people. So I think from that point of view, there is a, an agenda um, and it's certainly all about making money. I mean, over the last 15, 20 years, we've seen the emergence of a sort of super rich global elite um, who are just coining it in. And yet the people in, in these countries tend then to lose their standard of living. I mean, we're seeing it certainly in America now as well, because they've pumped so much money into the, in the Middle East wars. And their economy, economy is so shaky that they have tent cities, you know, people who are homeless living outside their cities. Their whole swathes of, of industrial areas of cities are sort of no-go areas, boarded up houses and no pro proper health care, everything. So America, again, itself has been asset stripped. So we are seeing this sort of super rich global elite who are there to make the money. In terms of where they want to go socially, obviously it's very useful for them to 
have um, the laws in place within each of these countries so that if there is civil unrest, if there is rioting on the streets because of what's, what is being done economically to the people, as we're seeing in Greece at the moment, they can crack down. They can watch out for distance and troublemakers. They can listen into all our telephone conversations. They can um, have massive, great databases uh, which record our movements, travel databases, which record our very way of life as we go about daily life in, in our countries. So that is certainly useful to them. And I see the campaigning that we're doing almost as a sort of race against them and us. They're trying to crack down on our freedoms so that we can't fight back if the conditions get unbearable. So there won't be any sort of uh, velvet revolution. There won't be a sort of um, reform within our countries. And we're racing to try and get people aware of what's really going on behind the scenes and what they're facing before that happens to such an extent that we can't fight back effectively. And I think it's very, very um, balanced at the moment as to who's going to win out. So that's a problem. And again, you know, going back to 9-11 as an exemplar, a nexus point of where all these different issues come together, I think it's a very good example to try and get people thinking and to get them active and to go out and start campaigning. Well, I mean, that's a very interesting question. Is there anywhere safe to go now? Um, when we look at the sort of the, the global positioning and how they're, they're trying to sort of erode all our freedoms. Um, I've moved to Germany because I think that is probably one of the safer places, uh, more stable places. They are resisting the sort of Milton Friedman School of Economic Thought. Um, so they're not selling off all their national uh, possessions. They're not asset stripping the country. They still have a strong um, industrial base. But more importantly as well, because of their experiences in the Second World War and with fascism, after that happened, uh, and certainly in West Germany, they put in place a rock-solid constitution protecting people's rights, their democratic rights, and ensuring that um, an all-powerful intelligence agency can't start spying on its people. I mean, they saw what happened in East Germany with the Stasi, and they made damn sure that there were legal protections for its citizens so that that couldn't happen again, and that they can't even begin to slide in that direction again because the government is not legally allowed to do those sort of things. So from that point of view, Germany's very good. Economically, Germany's very good. Um, and in fact, we're seeing a number of challenges even now going through right up to the federal Supreme Court, where the government is trying to push through the erosion of freedoms, um, increased electronic surveillance, um, and they're losing in the courts. The judges are upholding the Constitution. So it feels safer. Whether it stays that way is another matter, but I think at the moment it's a good bet. I mean, the other place that... I did think about going back to was France because again good constitution but looking at what's going on with um, Sarkozy's proposed economic reforms he's trying to push through again those sort of measures the French are resisting um, and they are demonstrating and striking and they're trying to ensure that won't happen but um, I think they're further down that road and their constitution isn't quite as strong. One small example is the idea of voting computers you know voting computers can be hacked and it's been established that they can be manipulated so that we're not even 100% sure that whoever, whichever puppet figure we elect to government, like in the US or in the Netherlands or in France even, there are concerns about how voting computers have rigged the elections. Certainly that's fairly well documented, at least with George Bush's uh, first election in 2000. And in Germany, again, they tried to introduce voting computers and state after state within the country has just said, no, we're not using them, we're sticking with paper, we want a paper trail. So at least they know there's a better chance that whoever is elected has actually genuinely been, been elected. No, I think it's very clear if you look at what's happened in the Middle East that there is a, a drive, um, certainly from the neocon uh, political classes in America, to try and find a pretext to attack Iran. And, of course, there's a lot of speculation as well that Israel might unilaterally attack Iran and then drag U the U.S. in behind it. That's one of the other problems. But certainly since the wars in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq, um, there are air bases that are ring round um, Iran. I don't think, though, that the U.S. could launch a conventional military attack against Iran. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the, um, the, the soldiers available to try and do something like that. So, of course, the worry would be that the justification will be found that, oh, Iran's trying to develop a nuclear bomb, so they go and use a, um, what they call a strategic nuclear weapon against one of the sites. Now, they do that. It's still going to be probably more powerful than the bomb that went down on Hiroshima, and it's going to irradiate the area and probably irradiate the, the prevailing winds that will then come straight back across Israel and Europe. So 
in terms of a war crime, I can't think of pretty much anything more heinous. I don't think there's a doubt, though, that they would like to be able to do that. They could do. I mean, that's certainly a concern that an attack goes ahead against some Western target and it's blamed on Iranian-backed groups. Absolutely. But they may find that they just fabricate evidence that they're trying to produce a bomb, and that will be enough. It depends um, on the will of the American military and the will of the Israeli military, certainly. But I think the fabrication of evidence might be uh, enough to try and justify something like that, because, it, of course, Israel is uh, the illegal owner of about 200 nuclear warheads anyway, and they're paranoid about Iran um, getting the bomb. So one way or the other, there'll be some sort of falsification, whether it's an attack or whether it's evidence. Because, of course, don't forget that there was um, a very famous national intelligence estimate that came out of the States back in 2007, where they got all the 16 intelligence agencies to assess whether or not Iran was trying to develop a bomb. And they all 16 unanimously said, no, they're not. And, of course, this has been challenged ever since, particularly by the Israeli military infrastructure, saying, no, no, we've got evidence, we've got evidence, we can find evidence. A bit like they found evidence around uh, the Syrians trying to develop a nuclear capability and, of course, just went in and had a quick airstrike. So, yeah, I think there'll be some sort of falsification, whether it's attack or whether it's the evidence is another matter. It's interesting with the whole um, issue of Palestine, of course, that again and again in the mainstream media you see that Iran is blamed for backing um, groups like Hezbollah and Hamas and things like that. So they're trying to find, again, a, a sort of pretext, a linkage between what's going on in Palestine and, and any sort of intifada or revolt or whatever level with the Iranians. So, yeah, I mean, everything that's being done to the Palestinian um, settlements is illegal. I mean, how they can shut them, pen them in and not even allow aid through. I mean, remember during the um, attack on Gaza a couple of, was it about 18 months ago now? And they were just trying to get aid you know, aid ships in, I and mean, people like Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, who was actually on board a boat that I think was organised by Dr David Halpern. And they get arrested, they get rammed by the Israeli Navy when they're in international waters, they get arrested, um, and they're held in communicado for days just for trying to get food and medical supplies to the people in the Gaza Strip. And how a people, a race, um, who were victims of the Holocaust can then go and perpetrate the same sort of conditions as you know, was perpetrated on, on um, things like the Polish ghettos is beyond me. I mean, how they can do that and just get away with it under international law. They've been subject to UN sanctions for, you know, four decades now, and they're still not being penalised because they're still under the protection of the US. And the US, of course, always exercises its veto in the UN to stop any censure attack, uh, attaching to um, Israel. I think as well, uh, the other problem, of course, with... Uh, with the reporting within the mainstream media of the atrocities that go on against Palestinians by the Israeli state, I'm not saying necessarily the people, but by the state, um, is, is just not reported adequately. And we do see people running scared because of some of the big Israeli lobby groups like AIPAC in the States. You know, if, they, if a politician even breathes a hint of, of censure of what is being done by the Israeli military, then they are leapt upon with great ferocity and pilloried in the media. So it frightens everybody off from even going anywhere near there, that subject. No, I mean, the whole case of the war against Afghanistan, I mean, it stinks. They were ready to go into that country within weeks of the attack on 9-11. Um, and, of course, they, they wanted to protect the uh, building of the gas pipeline. That's where most of the military effort has gone, which secures gas reserves for the American market. Um, and they have to be extracted and then transported across Afghanistan. Um, but yes, the idea that Osama bin Laden was supposed to be hiding there, the Afghanistan government, the Taliban government, said, well, if they were presented with proper evidence, as you know, is legally required under international law, then of course they would extradite him to the US to stand trial for his alleged involvement in 9-11. And the Americans just refused to give any sort of evidence and went in and bombed the country instead. So again, an obvious illegal war, an obvious war crime. And um, whether Osama bin Laden is even still alive is up for debate. Again, Professor David Ray Griffin has done a lot of research into this, and his view was he, he died years ago at the end of 2003. So, uh, sorry, 2002, I think, wasn't it? So even that idea, the, the 
the pretext for that war was bogus. Um, if they'd adhered to any basic standards of international law, they would not have gone in. They would have waited for their chief suspect to be handed over, and they didn't. And, you know, it's, it's a mess. It'll go on forever. I mean, Afghanistan has defeated empire after empire, so it's going to be yet another Vietnam, I think, for America. Well, I'd say uh, initially just get informed, you know, stop believing what you read in the mainstream media because it's too controlled. Do your own research um, and follow whatever trail interests you. And then, of course, start informing other people around you and spreading the word and getting active and organising meetings and getting good speakers. And by getting um, people with a certain um, profile, sometimes you can get local media coverage as well, which gets the word out even further. So the effect can snowball. But first of all, you know, start informing yourself, start educating yourself, because it's not going to be in the papers, it's not going to be in the books, and it's not going to be in the, in the history books, certainly. So that's the initial start. Um, I would counsel, though, against uh, getting too dissipated, uh, disparate in, in the message. If you're going to say, well, look, you know, we're fighting on certain issues, then stick to those issues. Um, because I think quite often I've seen very good groups be established, and then people just get wider and wider and wider in their interest areas, it becomes almost a hobby. And it's not a hobby, it is a race against them cracking down on us and us pushing back. So if we're going to be serious about this, we need to be relatively disciplined as well in how we approach that. So I think that is key. Um, try and avoid any sort of infiltration. I mean, people will come into these groups, um, whether, probably not the intelligence agencies, but certainly the local police force, encouraging perhaps violence. And we're not a violent movement. We are here to... Um, campaign for world peace. So, of course, we're not going to use violence in any of those issues. Um, and also try and avoid too many divisions about too many different aspects. I mean, again, with a subject like 9-11, it does become a bit of a hobby, and people get very enmeshed in speculating about what happened on the day. And that can be fascinating, but that's the hobby aspect. If we want to campaign politically about it and activate people and wake them up and get them democratically um, campaigning again, we need to be more disciplined and say, well, look, you know, there are all these questions and all this evidence that contradicts the official account, but we don't have the answers yet. We can't say definitively one way or the other what did happen. But, you know, get people thinking about it. So there is an aspect of um, discipline, and certainly in terms of the campaigning side of things. But I think it's key. I mean, the democratic reactivation is key. People are so turned off by mainstream politics now, and they become so depressed and frustrated and trapped, because it doesn't matter if you vote in the general election, it doesn't make a blind bit of difference to what happens to our countries. So I think this can be um, an energising and a positive thing to campaign around, even though it's a rather um, macabre topic. And I think also, on the other hand, we need to get activists to focus on uh, more strategic, <coughs> high-level campaigning as well, where we can reach out to some of the political classes who are a bit more sensible, um, and the academics, and get the professional groups really focusing on, on the evidence as well, because they have more clout, I think, in, t in people's perceptions and will add credibility to the movement. So it's a sort of number of different fronts. But I do see it as a very positive and energising force for good. So I'd also say as well that there are many, many people out there who are slightly afraid, perhaps, of an issue like this. Um, they might be frightened of peer ridicule, they might be frightened of uh, rocking the boat and perhaps losing jobs or something like that. But even if they can't be seen to be active campaigners themselves, if they think these issues are important and they think they are uh, core for safeguarding the future of their children and their communities, then they should help those who are able to do the campaign, who are able to get out there and try and make a difference. So again, you know, these sort of groups and activities and meetings don't come free. So if people can't put their heads above the parapet, then support those who can. I think that's also key. Mm -mm. No, and that's great. That's precisely what I was saying. Is you know, once you start researching this, you end up going down all sorts of different avenues because the linkages are there. I mean, nine eleven is the nexus that brings together all these sort of examples of um, intelligence uh, failure, intelligence cover-ups, intelligence false flag attacks, media manipulation, uh, political corruption, um, potentially getting involved in in what is effectively a sort of coup type scenario. You know, it's all it pulls together all these different aspects. Um, but yes, I mean, of course people should follow whatever interests them, and these subjects do interlink. Um, but I think you know, each person individually has to decide what their expertise or areas of interest are and follow that. I mean, you know, this is a sort of following your conscience type moment as well. But I think it, it's more where people 
um, get too lost in, the, in the, the, the sort of macro picture. And then they will start fighting with each other about, oh, no, my, my theory is better than your theory. And that just leads to um, a dispersal of the movement. And I think, you know, they've beaten us if that happens. It's an old, old, old um, tactic, which is divide and conquer. And whether, whether this is being deliberately manipulated from outside and they're putting people in the movement to try and do that, or whether it's just ego and people, you know, you're treating it as a hobby rather than serious life and death campaign, it doesn't matter. We have divided and conquered ourselves. So... No, I think, you know, there are certain core issues that do interlink and it's great that, um, that you're out there and you're campaigning on that. But I would tell people to beware, beware perhaps getting too big, too vast, because um, that just leads to a weakening. There is so much anger at what the banks have done, you know, since the credit crunch happened and how they're manipulating our economies and how they're betting on, you know, economies of whole countries crashing like they did with Greece that, of course, it's a very easy way to say, well, you know, people have anger about it. They're concerned about their mortgages. They're concerned about their jobs. And that can start a dialogue. And, of course, then, then you can start discussing the interlinkages and the other issues. That's a great way. And same with globalisation, particularly when you're in a, a town where there's a sort of awareness of the need to support local business, um, not be taken over by the, the big chains and all that sort of thing as well. I think that's, again... Find the, the ways in to begin discussing some of these issues, which is precisely what you're doing, and I think that's, that's great. Uh, it's very important. Also, the wars. I mean, again, there's so much anger about the illegal wars our countries have been dragged into. That's slightly more difficult, though, I think, because so many people did try and stop them. They marched against them. They lobbied their MPs. And then the Parliament still voted to take us into these illegal wars and ignored the will of the people. That Actually, a lot of people were very depressed about that experience as activists. So that can be quite a difficult one to, to reactivate, in a way, as a campaign issue. But um, no, because they're all interlinked, I think that's great. And um, yeah, go out and lobby. <laughs> and I think you'll find that you'll have so many willing recruits to talk about issues like that. Once they, they start looking at the issues around banking or they start looking at the issues of globalisation, it's a, it's a very easy way in, a very important way in. I think um, one of the things in terms of what I would focus on increasingly now is looking uh, what we can do to push back. And I very much support the idea of the democratic re-empowerment. That's what I've been campaigning on for years and years, you know, doing lots of tours and, and getting other people's tours and speaking and interviews and everything. Because I think people, once they begin to look at some of these issues, then they do wake up, and that's absolutely great. But I think one of the other effective ways of trying to campaign is um, more sort of information guerrilla warfare, which... Um, Certainly I had some experience of during whistleblowing years back in the 1990s and you can get them on the back foot and catch them unexpectedly and they don't quite know how to deal with some of these issues. So one of the areas um, that I find is more effective now is, is trying to sort of look at the technical political uh, field, the sort of hackers and things like that. So, for example, um, supporting sites like WikiLeaks, um, they recently had quite a big media hit where they had a military tape of um, an American helicopter shooting up some innocent Iraqis and killing and injuring um, citizens who were trying to help wounded fellow citizens and injuring children and things. It was disgusting. And the voiceover of the American pilots was almost like they were playing some sort of sick remote video game. You know, they were just pleased they kept hitting them. And the Pentagon covered up this, this film. They've covered up many films. And they thought they'd buried it. And they lied outright about it. And then you have a site like WikiLeaks who got hold of it and had access to the people who could decrypt a film like that and they did and so it's posted on WikiLeaks and the story reverberates around the world and something like that can shock people into becoming active again or just becoming active full stop so I think if we can harness those sort of skills as well you can sort of hit them hit the authorities hit the powers that be in a sort of unexpected way and catch them on the back foot and catch them out as they lie to us as well so things like that um, you know, encouraging whistleblowers, encouraging leaks and getting this sort of information out there is, is very key. Absolutely, yes. I think um, a lot of people go into areas such as the intelligence services or government, potentially, um, with in their 20s with ideals. They want to have a job that makes a difference, that can do some good and protect people. So if they then find themselves in an environment where, as now, MI5 officers are accused of being complicit in torture, for example, which is illegal under every law across the planet, then they have a duty as idealistic or conscience-driven um, people to do something about it, absolutely. 
So I would encourage other people to step forward and blow the whistle if they see criminality and they see illegality and lies and false flag terrorism, of course, because although it's um, a very difficult thing to do and it does change your life irrevocably, there's no going back, you know that you're doing something for the right reasons, you know you're doing something that potentially can help save lives um, or help save our way of life, our democratic values. I mean, all of those things. How could people not want to step forward and do that? And I think it's different now. I mean, I'm going to sound like an old codger, but back in the 1990s when uh, Shayla and I did blow the whistle, of course, it was a very different um, environment within which to do it because the main channel, of course, was still the mainstream media. The internet was in its n infancy. It wasn't nearly as effective as it is now. If people do choose to blow the whistle now and come forward with evidence of crimes, then they can be protected. Their anonymity can be assured by organisations like WikiLeaks. So it's a very different playing field and there's a chance that they will get away with it, a chance they won't be prosecuted. But of course also that if they are arrested and they are put on trial, um, they can fight their corner much more effectively because of the internet. You know, everything will be recorded, everything will be put on YouTube. They will have much more um, awareness amongst the population and much more protection from that. So yes, of course, of course people should blow the whistle if they, if they feel they should. And I would say as well that you do something um, extreme like blowing the whistle and having to go on the run from the intelligence agencies. Yes, it's harrowing and frightening and um, it, it scares your family and it's just very, very difficult. But on the other hand, you learn something about yourself. You know, you find new skills and strengths and from that point of view, the experience in itself is very rich. Even if your life afterwards isn't. <laughs>
So I'll be helping out and working with people at WikiLeaks a bit more. Thank you. And of course, one of the most heinous things is the idea that our intelligence agents are now getting involved, intelligence agencies are now getting involved in torture. There seems to be a growing body of compelling evidence to suggest that they are complicit in torture sessions. I mean, can you imagine you're uh, you know, an innocent man going about his business, snatched off the streets, taken off to some black prison camp where you're tortured for years, up to and including, like in the Bin Yan Mohammed case, having his genitals cut with a razor repeatedly. And there are intelligence officers there. They're, they're listening to the replies. They're feeding in questions. They know what's going on, but they're not helping you. But you can hear a British voice through the hood that's over your head. And the thing that haunts me is that those officers might well be people that I used to work with. They might have been my friends. I might have gone out for a drink with them or had them around to my house for dinner or something. And yet, how could they make that moral journey from the people I might have known in the 90s, idealistic 20-something uh, officers, to people who would do that to another human being, be complicit in that sort of activity to another human being. And I think, again, that's part of the problem with the intelligence agencies, is that they are a very closed shop. They become a self-perpetuating oligarchy where no whistleblower, no criticism is allowed. And therefore, they get this sort of group think that leads them down a very dangerous path. And I think that's one of the reasons why they've got involved in things like torture. So we are looking pretty much at a police state. We're getting to a point of sort of lockdown in the UK. And in fact, seeing it from an external perspective now, it's become a bit of a sort of sad joke uh, to the rest of Europe. And even people in America look at the UK and say, my God, it's really bad over there. Do you really have that many CCTV cameras? I mean, it's, that, that, it's got that bad. And again, all done in the name of 9-11. So this is why I think 9-11 itself is a, such an important issue. It's a sort of nexus point. It pulls together all these different um, strands of deceit and, and falsehood and false flag terrorism. And if we can spread the word effectively about the subject, if we can get people to look at the evidence themselves and begin to wake up to what was done on that day, suddenly they will start doing their own research. Please go out and start digging, because it will lead you on all sorts of interesting paths on many of the sort of subjects that we've heard about today from all these excellent speakers. So that's where I really want to leave it. Please inform yourselves and then go out and inform your friends and your family and your community. Make a fuss, like Brian Gary said, just keep in their faces. Don't let them off the hook. Because if we don't take a stand now, we really will wake up one day to feel the heavy boot, the jackboot on our necks.